All right, recording's in progress. Okay, so I'm Sakai, and uh, this is another episode of uh, Pedal Drive Information. And today we have uh, Jean Gustav and her husband Evgeny Gustav. And uh, uh, Jean is the uh, captain of Team Stay Like a Girl uh, at the uh, Race to Alaska World in 2018 with a win. Um, and then 2019, if I have it right, with fourth place. And then this year with uh, uh, Washington 360, uh, fourth place finish as well. But I know you have a whole lot more sailing background than that. And I wonder if you'd um, sort of talk a little bit about that and, um, and kind of how that led to you um, joining the Northwest Maritime Center's events that have sort of helped propel pedal drive in our region. Yeah. Well, I um, graduated college more than 20 years ago <laughs> and uh, moved to Boston and needed a hobby. So I took a learn to sail class and um, that's where I met this guy. Uh, we've been married now for 19 years and um, so fell in love with, uh, well, with a, a sailing instructor and also with sailing and have been sailing ever since. And so um, just we've, we've done everything from, you know, one design racing in Boston and moved out here to the West Coast about 16 years ago. Um, we now have our own uh, 40 foot boat who um, we just, love racing. She's a freestanding rig and a really fast um, cold molded cedar kind of one design or sorry, not one design, custom design boat. Um, and we love racing her together. We do lots of double handing. We race with full crew as well. And we are distance racers mostly. Um, Grey Wolf is not a buoy racer. So love being out and doing, you know, those more than 15 mile races. We do a lot of 100 mile races, some 200 mile races around Puget Sound, um, lots of overnights. And, and I just, I love being in the ocean at all times of day. I love being out there with the stars over your head. And I love, you know, the long, um, the long timelines that uh, those hours and hours and days kind of lead to uh, being on the water. So um, I would say that what led me to race to Alaska was um, really, a, it, it was an idea of, of Anna, a friend of mine who was out racing with us for the weekend. She's, we kind of spent the whole weekend racing in a pretty male dominated um, arena that weekend. And she said, you know, would you ever want to do race to Alaska with a women's crew? And it kind of started from there. So I thought it was a brilliant idea. Um, I'd never done a 750 mile race. I had um, done boat deliveries of that distance, but not anything uh, competitive of that magnitude. So um, was really excited to jump in with both feet, so to speak. And uh, within what a month we were down in California buying a Malgus 32 and I started building a team. Nice. So when you say within a month, so when was that bef sometime before the race? It was, it was, um, no, yeah. about November. Yeah. November 7th. Of 20, yeah. 2017. <laughs> so November 7th, 2017. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We already bought the boat. We bought the boat and then we had to start figuring out because Race to Alaska is wind and human powered. Yeah. We saw the Mountain yeah. 32 as a really good option. It's a boat that... Evgeny has raced a lot more than I had to that point. Uh, our friend had a Melgus 32 and we thought, okay, if we're going to put bikes on a, on a boat, um, having that open transom was really attractive. It made it a lot easier to start thinking through how we were going to put human power on, right. on a, a Ferrari. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and that was the, the weight of the vessel, the displacement, uh, a factor? Were you thinking of that? Or was it just that it was a fast sailboat and then you would make it work for the human power? It was that it was a fast sailboat. I mean, if you add seven women and all of our gear and our, you know, we had um, lots of 
life-saving equipment. We had a life raft on board. Um, we were carrying water for a week for seven people. You know, you start to add all of that weight. Um, yes, trying to keep the boat as light as possible was a priority and a factor, but um, more than anything, we were looking at the boat design of, you know, how can we add easy pedal power to um to a sailboat and and certainly the lighter the boat starting out the lighter the boat ending up right <laughs> so right the right. Boat 32 is a pretty light pretty light so for uh, us it was all about flat bottom and a very long keel with a bulb right so mm -hmm. less resistance through the water yeah. i mean we even floated ideas of lifting keel it also has lifting keel because the boat can go on the trailer so that one point was insane ideas of lifting keel to get the water, you know, like surface area down. Oh, right. Fast, right? Yeah. So I mean, there was all these options with a just platform, you know, and it was Uber like boat, you know, so which means that, you know, ideally that's what you want, you know. Evgeny, can so, you move closer to the, the microphone? Yes. Yes. And um, that was the idea. I mean, idea is that the light boat and Race to Alaska can, you know, could, it's a winning combination because this right. other monohull did it, but they were, I wouldn't say not as fast because some of them went faster days, but, you know, it was from trimarans. I mean, the biggest thing, like everybody right. at the time thought process was trimarans is the fastest thing for right. catamaran and trimaran for that race. And we basically, that was our answer for the fastest monocle. Got it. Because Got I it. think monocle community decided that winning this race was impossible. That's that's actually, I think, a key because everybody we talked to said monocle will never, ever win this race. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now two have won. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. Um, in, in lighter and heavier. So because we had a, you know, the year that we won, it was a lighter year. We biked, we, we figured we biked 75 hours in that six and a half days. Wow. Um, and, but this last, the last race to Alaska, again, a monohull winning, um, we were, we were getting hammered out there. We oh. had, uh, we had a yeah. lot of wind. We had yeah. a lot of wind. We were, you know, we were, consistently in the 20 knot to 30 knot range and sometimes in excess of that um pretty right. much right you pretty much the whole time we're out there your time in 2019 was faster than your winning time in 2018 yeah by yeah. days yeah yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no i remember the stories of hecate Strait, and it was quite uh terrifying actually <laughs> to hear <laughs> we we saw some weather out there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is, you know, it's a little intimidating in a day sailor with, with no engine when you're a couple hundred miles away from land. But, you know, I, what I have found about our pedal drives and, and maybe we can get into this a little deeper at some point, but um, I, I, I believe in my pedal drives and what they are capable of doing a lot more than I believe in my outboard. <laughs> yep. So they're a lot more reliable. I mean, coming into a marina in tight quarters, I would way rather have my boat sickle under full pedal power than um, having my outboard in the water and, you know, right. trying to mess, up, mess with it. It's, um, it's just not reliable, but people's legs are pretty reliable. Can so. I might remember this wrong, but can you go backwards with your pedal drive? We can, yeah. Okay, because that's so, I um, was. It's not perfect, but we can. And so, for getting getting in and out of a marina, for sure, for those kinds of distances, absolutely. I don't know if I'd like do a hundred yards with it, but right. you know, we can get we can get in and out of tight spots and, and have some reverse. For Plus sure. you twin yes. So so so. It's a direct link. You can absolutely, so the, we actually did, um, specifically did not install the line that would hold the pedal drive down because intentionally when the boat speeds up immediately, when a sail fills in and the boat speeds up, the propellers push the drive to the surface and you oh. actually not have the drag. Or for example, when people switching, same thing, the drive comes up, right? 
or yeah. if you had heat something, for example, at night or wherever, you know, like the fiddle drives come up. Now right. there was a flip, you had a bungee to kind of create a little bit of a resistance there. But in reality, if there was a line set up, absolutely. It's like uh, any other drive. You can go up and down, forward, reverse, but it's direct drive and there is no clicking. It's not like a bicycle. You release the pedals and, you know, the propeller goes click, 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 click. It's continuously, your pedals will be moving if oh. the boat is moving forward, right? Okay. So you have okay. to put your feet on it and catch up. So, well, the, the mem uh, two things come up in my mind. One was that the memory, I was at uh, Point Hudson when you left to go out and for the start and, you know, was watching all the boats go. And I, and as I remembered, I, you backed out of the slip and then went forward and I was like, yeah. Oh my goodness. And then I heard later what you learned, what you could sustain, but I was like, Oh, that's it. That's and engines are out. Pedal drive is the way to go. If you can back out of a slip with twin screws on a, on a boat like that, I was just like, that is amazing. But the, yeah. so with the, um, so I'm curious then with if it's direct drive, did you get into onto the seats and with, with the propeller up and get your feet in onto the pedals and then push the drive down so you wouldn't have to catch up with the pedals? Okay. Most of the time, unless we were, it depends on how many people were on deck. <laughs> right. You have to have somebody pull the line for you to dump your propellers in the water. Um, okay. So I can now do it myself. <laughs> Oh, uh, by getting my feet into, um, getting my feet onto the pedals and then going up and over the rail and grabbing the line, yanking it and okay. sitting down, gotcha. ready to go. But, um, yeah, so it, it, it goes at a pretty good clip if, um, you don't have your feet in the straps before right. prop is down. And can but you... we would always, when we were switching out, we, we would typically, you know, we would swap by having a person go to the back of the boat, pull the prop up, have the person on the bike hop off, new person right. goes on, and the old person drops the prop. Okay. And can, with your feet in there, can you resist enough to, to stop the propeller? Not you that can you resist definitely... enough to stop it. Okay. Yeah. It's not okay. really, it's not really difficult to do that, but. Okay. But on their own, they go to the clip. This concept we developed uh, by watching other people pedaling in the past is where, you know, I would watch people pedal, 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 and then they would jump off the bike and run and go do something and oh, then right. come back. And during that time, the boat would come to complete stop. And then once they get back on the bikes and start pedaling, or you could see if another person pedaling, the boat just slows down to a knot. So our concept was that Soon as you stop paddling, get it out of the water because the resistance is resistance is futile. And right. it's a transitions, right? Yeah. So transitions between people switching on and off, transitions between tired, no tired. If the drive comes up, you glide through the water, you know, and if you don't do that, you just stop in the boat in the water. Was that part of the thought of having two? Was that you could transition people out and, and keep the boat moving? It was more an idea of how much power can we put in the water? But, <laughs> how okay. much but, space do we but have? Yes, but, that was yeah. high in the consideration too. Having mm. two people is much more fun paddling than having one. Sure. Yeah. You need a bike, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're going to be well, outboard. Well, also, well, design has... concept because each side, right? So it was easier to design two rather than one in the center. Sure. Because you have a back, stay, you have a rudder, you have all this. So having two was actually easier to design. Right. Yeah. We, we called um, the back of the boat, the peddlers were the peanut gallery because it's, there's this really strange thing that happens when you are, you know, three or four feet behind the transom of a sailboat, the sound doesn't carry quite the same. Oh, so, you know, and you also have an amazing vantage point. I could look at our mainsail trim like nobody's business if I was back on the boat, sure. on the bike. Yeah. So, um, but you know, all the songs were made up 
on the bikes in the back of the boat. All the jokes were being cracked on the bikes on the back of the boat. We had a little bell. So anytime we passed somebody like on the starting line or leaving the harbor, we would ding at them and say, passing on your left. Um, we had a lot of fun with it too. But the thing is, you know, being three to four feet off the back, depending on if you're, we had an upright seat and a, and a um, recumbent seat, depending like on that. how far yeah. back you are, the weight distribution and the effect of the weight on our boat, which is a light boat, is pretty dramatic. So right. we had to, you know, we, we put as much weight forward as we can. Um, in Race to Alaska year two, we stored all our water in the bow. Right. Um, at first, thinking we were going to have light air and knowing that we needed to counterbalance all of the weight that was feet off the back of our boat. It's a, it's a huge lever that it creates. So yeah. um, for a really weight sensitive boat like an August 32, you've got to be really careful at how flat you are and um, and where you're putting the other things on the boat, people and, and stuff. Right. Yeah, I, I remember. Well, you again. You, the, the, speaking of peanut gallery, there was all kinds of people outside saying you had overloaded like, the boat, and and then oh yeah. Know, well, how do you was, take seven women up to Alaska when you don't know? Right. I don't know. Is it going to take four days or two right. weeks? <laughs> oh, you don't know exactly. And then I guess as you got closer to Ketchikan, you started dumping the, some of the water. And, oh yeah. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, no, it, it, it's understandable. I, it was when you. I was just thinking about the kind of the social aspect of being that far back that it was probably louder where you were pedaling and people on board could hear you better than you could hear them because exactly. of the weight. Yep. And so sometimes yep. they would overhear you say things. Maybe that you were, oh, and wait, you think they, that they can't hear that you're talking about them. Yeah, right. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it all worked out. Um, all right. So what, um, Maybe we could talk about the design a little bit more. What what components? Was there anything that was sort of uh, factory built? Was it or was it all custom design? Yeah. So um, we we found a wave walker um, kayak pedal drive that we ended up using. You know, really the the structure of for our pedal drives themselves. Um, the pedal drive that we got was actually, um, it was sold on Craigslist by a woman who was selling her deceased husband's pedal drive system. And his dream was to actually take pedal drive his kayak up to Alaska. So we were really excited to take it for him up to Ketchikan. Um, and then we found a second one after we knew that this was something we could work with. Uh, we found a second pedal drive system. And then Evgeny is again, like the master craft and, um, worked with one of our local welders. Um, we had so many drawings on the backs of napkins on our dining room table, trying to figure out, you know, what to, what to create and, um, how to put it all together. But he did an amazing job with, with the welders to then create kind of the bike frame and structure and the way of yeah. attaching those pedal drives, a way of having them be lifting and all of those things. I don't know if you yeah. want to say anything about and the that. Two, and the two seats. I mean, I think that was a really great idea for yeah. different positions to be in. It was amazing to have an upright and a recumbent option because the upright, you get tired really quickly, but you can sprint. Right. And the recumbent, we, you know, there were times where we'd be on that bike for an hour at a time, I would say, probably at most, um, especially in year one, we were doing an hour spell. Um, you don't, you get tired, but you don't, it, it's a pace that you can kind of keep going with. It's, you know, it's like walking. Right. <laughs> um, so especially where we had, you know, a week of 75 hours of biking times two bikes, it's 150 hours with seven people, it was more than, you know, more than 20 hours a person um, That's a lot, yeah. over six days. So it was a lot of biking and, you know, but the, you, you could do an hour, you could do an hour and you, you were okay. And in the recumbent position? In the recumbent, yeah. not in the upright. The upright, I could do 15 minutes. Oh, wow. So <laughs> when we did the calculations, right, uh, there was a lot of thought process a lot of people were thinking of and I talked to a lot of people who did gears 
And all of that stuff, broke. majority of the bikes did not make it, right? I mean, a lot of them broke down. Yeah. So simplicity was the key. Number two is, this is exactly my thought process was, I talked to quite a few uh, people around who a bike for every day, right? Sure. For fun. And uh, the sustainability of the uh, RPMs of your legs, right? Like, what do you truly do when you sprint, when you coast and all this stuff. And when we tested, you know, like the thought process was exactly it, that in the recumbent position, you go slow. It was, it's, it is very hard bikes to bike. It's maybe actually maybe beneficial, or we always thought that maybe beneficial to make them lighter. But guess what? This year, the last year we did that, I watched the videos and the girls bike in exactly same cadence. It's exactly same rotation. The, hmm. But the boot, uh, the boot speed was slower because um, I think where the thought process, and again, it, it, until you prove it, right? Nobody knows. Right. So with the two bladed skinny propellers, my personal opinion. That was year one and year two. Year one and two. It was very hard to bike. But because let me just chime in here because it was a piston motion with two bladed propellers. It was more like an elliptical. It was this kind of piston with your feet. It wasn't yeah. a smooth at all. It what, was a boof, boof, boof. When the boof. blade comes across the drive. Sure. Because they were uh, uh, propellers were facing rear uh, yeah. in reverse. Right. So because the way they the, when a blade come across, you have this hump, hump. Hump, right. Hump. That's hard it's, on the it knees. Wasn't. It's hard on the knees. Really hard on the knees. But, but, you know, the boat, number one, I believe transitions from biking to sailing were much faster. Um, and then the propellers were more aggressive. Mm. So the last year we went and we got three bladed heavier propellers on purpose to think that because uh, some people had a success with the flywheel motion, thinking that if you put the flywheel on, heavier propeller and you speed it up, right? It, it's gonna be easier. Right. I don't think so. I mean, you know, the biking became smoother. The biking felt easier, it was slower. But it was overall, it was slower speed. Like, hmm. I mean, the girls, I don't think they break out, like the idea was to break out above 3.2 knots. Yeah, and I don't think we ever did. I mean, the the boat speed was 2.4, 2.6. Yeah, and I mean every tenth count. I mean that's how that's how other boats. I think who looked at our bikes got a um, little bit better. They got maybe a little bit better gearing, but they all stayed with the two bladed propellers, and they would do 3.2, uh, maybe 2.7, 3.2, and we were still in a slower category, especially this last year. I mean, Interesting. Because because I don't think I mean, but unless you test it in the in the race, how do you know, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there is no there's no books written about it. There is. Theories. Well, that's the thing. You all are writing the books yeah. right now, yeah. Huh. So. It's I don't know. In my as you're explaining it, it seems like there should be. I mean, for the for the racers, the three blade is you know more sustainable. It sounds like it, that felt better. Yeah. It so felt it, better so maybe on the body, better on the body. Slower. So it's a, it's a longer race, right? Our goal is always first to the bar. If you're the fastest boat, you're the first to the bar. You're out there less time. And especially <laughs> for something like race to Alaska, right? You don't want to be out there for, I mean, depending on why you're out there, <laughs> exactly. you may choose. You are that speaking you don't to a guy who took 18 days to get from, right. I, we, we took 18 <laughs> days from Victoria. But we saw whales nice. 12 of those days. So it was lo it was lovely. Wow. Year one, we saw whales every day. Year two, we did not see whales one time. Oh, wow. That was so bad. Yeah. It was just. Oh, we from weird. Campbell River on up, we saw humpbacks almost every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Gosh. Um, amazing. Well, I just, yeah, I'm kind of curious. That, that'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm, I'm interesting to think, hear what Matt has to say about um, I know, I think he's gone with a two blade, but he also has no interference. He just has the shaft uh, hanging in the water. Because, because, so, so because of the design of the Walker Bay and the chain yeah. inside, 
we could not reverse them. You mean we would wave walkers. Wave walker. So yeah. sorry, we yeah. could not reverse them. If we had a front-facing propeller, it would yeah. have been more efficient. Number one. Number two is you would have gotten rid of this hump thing, but Perhaps, we could yeah. not do that because we have a chain-driven one direction, and it, otherwise you would have we would have pushed the chain against the tensioner. We would have destroyed them in a minute. Right. So they were not designed run in reverse in a long time. Right. Right. Yeah. That's that's the problem of that drives that we have. Yeah. Now the newer ones, the shaft driven ones, yes, you could do that. Mm. Okay. Interesting. I'm, yeah, because I think his is two two blades, but I still wonder. Mm. I wonder if there's two yeah. blade is the most efficient. Two blade is the most efficient propeller there is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, that's what a lot of planes have. Yeah. So in, in, in a slow, in a slow, so in I a slow wonder RPM, though. So I wonder RPM. because our blade design for our three blade was a much more compact, larger blade. So I larger wonder, blade, but smaller diameter. Yeah. Got it. And I, I wonder what would happen if we had a three blade that was both three long skinny ones. Yeah. Somebody needs to do that and tell me how it goes. <laughs> well, there was, uh, let's see, take take me to the pool room had that, and theirs was wave piercing, like right? it was above the surface. So it yeah, had that's right. like two blades. And then Bad Kitty, was that the, that was the first year, second year? I think they had a three blade that was also above the surface. So yeah, it's, I mean, the, the experimentation is kind of here and there and not on the same design boats no, and so forth. So it's still yeah. a little bit spread around. But that was a whole it other approach. To, yeah, it's hard to compare. I mean, we at one point we put a three blade and a two blade on, but we oh. couldn't really race each other because right. we're on the same boat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we could feel it. We could feel a feel. We could see, you know, okay, we're going to go same wind direction. You know we're gonna we're gonna go this amount of time we're gonna see what our max speed is on this bike then we're gonna switch to that bike but even our bikes are slightly different so it's it's a really hard comparison to draw right um and you have to if you have two different bikers or your biker gets tired like how do you how are you really comparing well comparing in the race that's the only way to do it comparing and i mean in the race it showed that sure. previous system was better mm -hmm. including the fact when everybody complained how hard it is you know, you should not go down on it. <laughs> Make it easier does not mean you're gonna go faster. You know right. what I mean? Right. So right. that's that's where that's where this it's a complicated balance. I think that everybody always have to account is you know, and I think having gears, I'll guarantee you that if we had a second gear that was lighter, that's where everybody would stay all the time. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know what I mean? People like yeah. sprinting yeah. out of the harbor, maybe for five minutes. But as soon as it's hard, everybody would switch to the lighter gear. Again, from my perspective as a designer, I wanted to see 3.2 knots. That was my goal. I wanted to be, because I watched the boats. I watched how every fast everybody went. And right. I knew that three knots is basically for all the new designers, everybody who designed in 1.5, you're not even close. Right. 2.5, you may be kind of there, but you know you lose it. Yep. Three knots is what you have to have to right. today to compete in the race to Alaska. Because and it's proven most boats did that. Um, After the uh, with the uh, the uh, Melges 24, those guys yeah. were even well, faster, right? Yeah. You know than uh, the even uh, Hart and Nick Hart. Williams this year on the they were very fast with mm -hmm. their bikes. I think they were faster than you dark, guys, right? Dark horse we competed with in a um we had an adventure race around with the island this summer, which was a good proving ground for us for Washington 360. Um and so we raced against Dark Horse, which was great. They completely spanked us on the starting line with their pedal drive. Oh okay. and we thought, uh oh. <laughs> Interesting. So that was a good that was a good boat to boat comparison of pedal drive versus pedal drive, and they just had a completely different design than us. Theirs were rear facing; they were down at the water level. So yeah. I look at their boat and think, for race to Alaska, that's nuts. It's just not sustainable to be able to pedal wet. like that. 
in the water that we are in up to Alaska. It's just, it's too rough. It's too cold. It's too all the things that you can't do that for days and days. So like in my mind, so he thinks about, can you hit three knots plus? And I think, is it sustainable for six days out there? Right. So there's this balance of like speed and stamina. And and it's true. I mean, the easier it is, the slower it is, right? right. For everything, whether you're whether you're um, trying to adjust your um, the pitch of of your um, propeller, or if you are going from a two blade or to a three blade and comparing like how easy something is, you're giving up on speed at right. some point. Right. But that but that interference piece seems like something to address, though. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, behind yeah. behind yeah. the structure of the the, uh, the lower unit, I, you know, yeah. one of the people I had lined up for the panel was Everard Martens, you know, and he built a, a, a drive for his San Juan uh, 30 and he raced in 2019 and he used a bicycle, a three speed bicycle gear and they did play with the mm-hmm. speeds. But again, I haven't gotten a full report on what she, you know, did they stick with the first gear? Or did they go up to the third gear? Um, mm-hmm. You know, and that and that is it's sort of in one place is is getting to what Evgeny's talking about. It's like, are, would they did they stay with the easier? Or did they go with the harder? Um, and yeah, so that would be, be interesting to find out. Yeah. So well, and to, this is why we had again like our we had our sit up. Yeah. You know, upright that I could go for fifteen minutes on, but I was gonna I was cranking. Like, right. That was like, you know you're you're sprinting on that upright seat the recumbent with our slow speed easy going so we had our our body positioning is what made us go hard and fast or go slow and you know gotcha so those are your two gears reclining recumbent and standing up yeah got it you're in a parka lounger or you're (laughs) you're sprinting right and using your body weight because this is standing up you can yeah stand on there exactly yeah. So what? So you can train them at sixty or at sixty RPM uh, on legs, right? Okay. And then when you in the recumbent, you went down to about forty-five. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Um. So what? What would you do differently now? What's the next experiment with the drive, or are you going to stick with what you had and with the two blades and? What do you think? I'm always the one with the ideas. And then Evgeny tells me that from an engineering standpoint, that's not going to work. No, no, <laughs> but no, I would no, say no. anything works. I, I just want 20 grand. <laughs> right, right. But <laughs> I would say, I mean, I'd be really curious about what a three blade prop with those long spindly, um, you know, legs would do for us. Yeah. Just because we've done the kind of short and snubby three blade and the long and luxurious two blade. And there's something that's between the two of those that I feel like would be worth looking at. But now sure. I'll let the engineer come in and tell me that, <laughs> that well, can what, happen. Can you, would you, would you uh, tell me about the sourcing of your propeller blades? Because uh, Matthew told me that he was getting his Are, from this fellow in Australia. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, our original propellers came with the Wave Walker, and we ordered extras just in case we snapped them at sea. We had we could change them out. Um, but the, do you want to talk about the three blade? How much of our secrets sure. do we want to give away? I guess sure, it's sure. But I mean, it, it's fine. But I mean, so he, he, here's the thing: when I call the designer of the uh, drives, and I have talked to him, he told me that he spent almost two years developing this particular propeller. Mm. From engineer standpoint, I will tell you and guarantee that at very slow speeds, there is nothing better than two-bladed propeller, period. Okay. There is no, there is nobody can make a three-bladed propeller better. Two-bladed is the most efficient thing to glide through the water. So the other thing is it has a ver- variable pitch in a different way where it's a super aggressive at the stem is that flares out, it becomes shallower, right? It's it's truly almost, um, it's a little bit different from the airplane propeller, but the idea is the way the water flows, right? So super aggressive at the stem and flares out towards the tips. I believe that that propeller for the speeds that he designed was actually the best. 
Now, for three-bladed propeller, it was simple for me because I work, this is what I do, I'm a marine engineer. I put engines in the boats all day long. Gear ratios, propellers, pitches is my game. Okay. And um, the uh, <clears throat> Cougars and Sons propeller in Seattle is the guys who literally handcraft propellers. I mean, they make propellers for, they used to even make them for the subs at one point. Uh, they, they make propellers for pretty much every fishing boat, all these guys that needs absolute, fantastically beautiful blades, those are the guys who handcraft it, right? So, and I talked to Doug and we kind of come up with the idea of taking a basic sailboat three blade propeller that he has, but then shape it slightly differently, remove the thickness of the blades, make it super skinny, sure. you know, and they did, they by hand, they shaped it out and reduce as much weight out of it as possible but still keeping a blade area. So uh, could we gotten somewhere maybe better if we have another two years of development and a constant testing? Possibly, you know, reducing the, I think with those three bladed propellers, the girls could have been doing 2.4 notes, uh, knots and tow at least two kayakers behind it. They became a tractor. I mean, they had a fantastic, uh, if it was wind against them and they had to bike, they would have punched the waves like there's no tomorrow. Right. So more torque. But the problem is you bike when it's light, you don't you don't you don't have much resistance. Right. And this is where this game is complicated. But I think two bladed propeller is still the best in that combination. And I think facing forward, two bladed prop, and I think gear ratios are very, very important. And legs. Say, say that part again. Yeah. What's important? Gear ratios and legs. Oh, gear I ratio. Mean, legs. Yeah, gear ratios maybe for people of different weight and different training, right? Because again, like you averaging, it's a constant compromise. There is no perfect picture. There is like most of us engineers always want to go to this perfection thing. Yeah. And on the boat, it's never the case. It's always compromise after compromise after compromise. And I think having gears potentially is a better choice because if you have a small person and you have a huge person, you have a short legs, big legs, uh -huh. weight, no weight, right? So the guy can, somebody can go bike at 60 RPM, somebody bikes at 45 RPM, you know what I mean? So the right. gears may give you ability to shift, Yeah. you know, and we didn't. Um, and again, it was a compromise of simplicity. Sure. rather than being complicated right and i could i could build an amazing bike for 10 grand at least yeah <laughs> because you have to you have to you have to create your own gears you have to create your own machinery you have to hire a cnc guy you have to have welders it, yeah it's not you can't just assemble something in the garage it doesn't exist right and again as more gears you put into the system Every gear takes efficiency off. If sure. you take a pure efficiency of one gear, one prop, and every time you add the gear, you lose five to seven percent. Five to seven percent. Wow. Right? Anytime you change direction, five to seven percent. So how many directions do you change? Right. You know, and this is where the this is where our bikes were so pure and simple. And I think that's the reason they were fast. Yeah, and, and it didn't break. Yeah, I think the what in the 360 this year there was a lot of um, failure. I mean, I think with uh, I think it was with Dark Horse. I think they then they repair, repair theirs like five times or something. I may have the, the boat wrong, but I think that's what I don't they said. Remember which boat it was, but yeah, I mean, it again. It looking at durability. It, it depends on what you know what people are using these. For. Yeah. But if you're looking at something like a long distance adventure race, it needs to not just perform in the now, but it needs to keep performing. And we've had these bikes now for five, four years. Um, yeah. I've got a dog. So she's going to go outside. No, no, uh, you might have um, heard ours too. <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing coyotes. So I'm hoping she's oh, going to go chase them down the road. But um, yeah, so. You know, it's it is about um, having things that last, and these bikes have lasted us this whole time. We're still using our original 
um, drives and that we had four years ago and we've been we've been using them consistently throughout the year throughout yeah and yeah. during the year so um yeah. there there's a trade-off um and i'm just thinking back to your question about anything else that we would change and you know the other thing i would change is i would try to solve for this weight issue because it is um it is really debilitating to a, a really weight sensitive boat like the malgus um we were looking at even chopping off our uh, recumbent bikes at one point this year just to get the weight forward and to get that canter lever effect um, off of the back of the boat because it's so detrimental to us. Yeah. But we decided that trade-off again was like, okay, we cut off our, our recumbent bikes. We're going to be doing 15 minute sprints, all of us. And right. how does that affect sleep? How does that affect sustainability? You know, not just hour by hour, but day by day when you're looking at biking for long periods of time, potentially. So we decided to keep our, our recumbent seats on the bikes, but, um, yeah. I, you know, I, I look enviously at some of the bikes that are facing backwards because the body weight of the bikers is so close to the transom right. where ours are just scooched about as far back as you can be. So I would probably swivel us around. I see that. Or yeah, yeah. Get, us, get us in closer somehow. And I don't see, know. this is where we have disagreements, right? So he being, likes to being see where he's going. I like to see where I've been. <laughs> being a Lotus 32 is when this boat flying downwind with a big kite. Uh, I am back. usually in the back of the boat. Yeah, uh, you're hanging off the back, but not when you're going 2.5 knots hold on, under the bicycle power. Hold on. Yeah. Listen. So the point, the point being is this, I mean, my consideration was that if you fly down within 20 knots and somebody fall down once, there'll be broken arms and broken legs because of that machinery. And I personally have fell down from the back position mm. when the boat hit the wave. And this, this boat, I mean, it doesn't apply to many other boats. Like, I mean, you're not going to have that on Olsen 30. You're not going to have that on San Juan 24. But right. on Melges, you work. Right. And this is like for me, even if you look the way I designed the pipes and everything, the frame hold on, I try to remove as much of it as possible. So if there is an event, there is safety in there. And having machinery on the back of the boat is not, to me, it's not, and, and the boat is so weight sensitive, exactly. Like you have to have the entire crew standing in the back of the boat in 20 knots. Right. And it's not the right spot, you know, for cogs, gears, pedals, and all that other stuff. Sure. One main sheet wraps in there, and you lie down on the side. Don't know what to do, you know? Mm. Melgis is a really fast boat, and, it, and, and I think a compromise between weight on the back versus this issue, to me, it's not an issue. <laughs> Sorry, babe. <laughs> no, and this is, yeah. Well, so this, Wait, this gets into a, an interesting question. Um, when, when I did the race, you know, we, we decided that we probably rowed a third of the way, we sailed a third of the way, and we rowed and sailed a third of the way. We were doing both. How much did mm -hmm. you pedal and sail at the same time? And I know that's sort always. of a judgment. Yeah, always. Um, the great thing about our pedal drives was that we could get to that, like, high twos, low threes of boat speed under pedal power, but we, you know, we would do it with our code zero and our mainsail up. And so you build a parent wind, right? And, and yeah. we could be in zero wind. And if you think of, you know, the, the convertible effect, if you're driving down the street at 30 miles an hour and there's no wind outside, but your convertible top is down, you can feel 30 miles an hour of wind in your face. It's the same right. thing for the sailboat. So the sailboat feels three knots of breeze, the sails fill and now we're sailing at 4.2 knots um, and we're hopping off the bikes because we're doing what we call white watering it's when you get so much air in the system that the drives are no longer doing anything for you and they're just creating resistance so we pull them up so um, we could be in zero knots of wind and we could be getting our boat up to four knots of boat speed sailing with with our sails up okay. we always had our sails up we would play with our sail configuration. We built a new sail this year that was more like a Jenniker. Um, it was a, you know, a, a, it was off of our bowsprit 
um, in a, an overlapping sail, really lightweight material that was designed specifically for biking um, so <laughs> that we would be able to capture as much wind as we could in, in our sails with as much of an upwind but massive sail area sail as we could. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's all about apparent wind. It's all about creating your own apparent wind and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You have zero knots of wind and you're going, you're sailing at four knots and, you know, and then eventually your sailing speed, the apparent wind slowly tapers off and you kind of peter out and you get back on the bikes and you build yourself back up to four knots of speed. So how long would that, long how long would it carry on? How, like how, if you got off the bikes minutes, at four? I mean, minutes, there are times where if there's no wind, we're, we're on and off, on and yeah. off, on and off constantly okay. of the bikes. But, um, yeah. You know, it's it's fun. <laughs> yeah, of course, it, it's fun to do for sure. Thing when your boat speed is faster than the wind speed. <clears throat> yeah, that's amazing, huh? Yeah. Wow, I'm makes this making it even more attractive. Um, <laughs> wow, it's interesting. So, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, Evgeny, what's the what's the name of the the propeller maker? Uh, well, the three-bladed propeller were Cougars and Sons in Seattle. And so uh, that's a three-bladed prop, and uh, uh, two-bladed props are original to our drives. Okay, two blades from Wave Walker, right? Wave Walker, mm -hmm. Wave Walker yeah. Okay. I just uh, I remember the name that uh, uh, Matthew had mentioned it was this fellow Rick Willoughby, who's been messing with pedal drive mm -hmm. in Australia for a long time, and so. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. He designed I that think the Wave Walker guy was Ralph. Is it Ralph? Ralph, well, yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of interesting conversations with him. I know I have his contact info. Okay. Still somewhere. Um, but he was the designer of Wave Walker. I want to say his first name was Ralph. Okay, great. Well, I, what I did is I put Rick Willoughby's info in the in the notes below the video with mm -hmm. Matthew for again just trying to give people some information for for this. I mean, I'm driving this from my own curiosity because I don't have a pedal drive yet. Um, but um, there was enough interest that people wanted to know. Um, yeah. Just maybe a slight uh, shift. I suspect you're going to uh, enter what race is available next year, the, the race to Alaska. We will see. Okay. We will see. Yeah. Had some. Um, some things may be standing in the way of this coming year, but um, okay. yeah, to be determined. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I know on away from pedal drive, this, you're, you're providing opportunities for a lot of women to, to get out into these yeah. sort of race systems. So I really okay. appreciate that. We Actually, will continue to encourage and, and, and do everything we can to help, you know, promote access for women out in sailing, um, Sail Like a Girl became a 501c4 organization this past year nice. with that mission of continuing to inspire women to get out on the water and to leadership roles on boats. So that work will absolutely continue no matter what. And um, yeah, to be determined what this coming year of sailing holds for us. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Um, yeah, I was thinking... I I've been thinking about, well, as I, I communicated with you uh, a couple of years ago about the, the student, uh, well, a f my friend's daughter, uh, Caroline, and um, she's been going off in all kinds of directions, but still sailing quite a bit. And so Good. we'll see, see awesome. what comes up with her. But uh, then this yeah. woman I know who's in her 60s or maybe 70s, I had as an Outward Bound student, and she had come, she had sailed for years and years in her married partnership, but to come and be an Outward Bound student, let her step out and be a little bit more of a leader. And I was thinking about her. Uh, I saw her again last last summer and I was like, oh, she, I could see it in her eyes that she she's still looking for those opportunities <laughs> to, yeah. uh, to get out There's of- There's nothing better, nothing yeah. better in the world than yeah. to, to find your strength yeah, yeah. It's, it's so satisfying and um definitely they should get out there and do all the things that they can and yep. enjoy it 
Yeah. Amazing. Well, great. Well, I, I could go on and on talking with you about that and some other topics, yeah. but I think uh, if it's uh, good with you, we can wrap up here. Anything else you wanted to add, at least under the sort of the topic of pedal drive and adventure races? No better way to get in and out of a marina, like I say. You know, it's uh, it's been so good to have those bikes on board sometimes. And um, it certainly causes a, um, an interest from the docks when you come in with a couple of bikes hanging off the back of your boat. But yeah. Um, it's a good way to go. I think it's, it, they're a lot of fun. I hope that things pick up speed. I was really excited to see that round would be race do an adventure class um, so that we could use our pedal drives. And I hope to see more races here in the Pacific Northwest. And it would be awesome if it took fire around the country um, that are allowing, you know, these alternative means of racing. Yeah. Um, if Jenny and I on any normal day are pretty hardcore racers and very pure in that. And in a million years, I wouldn't put a pedal drive on Grey Wolf and enter an adventure race. But <laughs> having it on the Melgus, it is so much fun. It is an entirely different way of, of sailing. And um, it is, yeah, I, I highly, I recommend it and I hope it catches fire because wouldn't have it any other way. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade my pedal drives for a new outboard engine ever. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, it's one of the things if, if we can get this to, you know, kind of a, a panel discussion at a festival again, I hope we can get it mm -hmm. out in the world. And I, yeah. I hope more people see this as an alternative propulsion, particularly in the, in the recreational realm, um, just yeah. to, you know, Definitely. Instead of, like you say, you trust yourselves, you trust, you know, getting a person on a pedal mm -hmm. drive more than, you know, pulling the cord on an outboard. Um, and it's, it's all the, the other attendant fuss. Um, and then there's the fossil fuel. So, um, yeah, great. It is so much better for the environment and so much better for your body to be moving it. You know, the, it's the, it was the best way to get warm on our boat. Right. So we would fight over it sometimes where it was like <laughs> the wind died. I'm first. Like we would, you know, you can't feel your hands anymore and you're right. so cold that you can't stop shaking. And it was like a dash to the bikes because it was the best way to warm up. Right. That's <laughs> awesome. A little hard. So uh, maybe yeah. we'll have to have a component of what's the best uh, nutrition to match, uh, you know, biking, biking at sea um, to keep, get your strength you up. Got to eat i lost eight pounds in year wow. one in that week um and i was eating i was eating like what i thought you know a normal yep. person should eat a couple thousand calories it was not we figured we were burning like five thousand calories a day at yep. least i mean between biking constantly and being cold and awake all the time um yeah so yeah it's a uh, we brought it's a good it's a way of getting moving i brought an well, I, one fellow on our boat had done the food, but he was a fast and light mountaineer. That was his approach to, to uh, <laughs> things. And this, as you said, was uh, a bit of an <laughs> this, this is a bit of an endurance event, right? And so I I showed up, knowing that he had done the food, but just knowing my own needs, with an extra, I think eight pounds of cheese and a half gallon <laughs> of olive oil. And he says, "What are we going nice. to do with that?" It says. We're going to consume. He says, all of it? He says, is that a challenge? And it's like, yeah. Half a gallon <laughs> yes. of olive oil was, was consumed before we got there, in addition to what was already in the Oh, my gosh. See, that's a good thing, having that high fat. We had a boat stop and give us two pounds of butter because he's oh. like, what do you mean you don't have any high fat things on board? You need butter. He said, hold on. And he literally <laughs> went head down in his cooler and came out with a brick of butter and gave it to us. And he, we said, well, you know, do you have any bread? And he's like, you don't need bread. Just cut the pieces up yeah. and eat the butter. Yeah. He's like, hang on. He, he got us a little, he had a loaf of bread too. And That's a mango. True. <laughs> That's true though. A pat of butter will keep you warm at night. Yeah, yeah it, so it apparently will. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, great. Well, I see the light going down there as it is here. You're on yeah. Bainbridge, is that correct? 
Tom Bainbridge. Yep. 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 Okay. Well, I'm here in San Juan. So thanks so much for your time and really appreciate yeah, uh, it everything. Yeah, a lot of fun. Offered. And um, look for forward to when we can all gather again in person. I know. Gosh, I hope soon. Stay <laughs> healthy, okay? Okay, you Be too. Well. All right. Have a good night. Good night. Take care. Bye.